It know. still wouldn't be enough. It fires me up, man. I love it. Say it one more time. Shake it back! <laughs> Does that feel good? Yeah, it rhymes. Woo. They're both verbs. And welcome back to the latest and greatest episode of the Shave and Points podcast. My name is Jaden May, joined as always by my co-host Quentin Crisco. And tonight we are talking college football. I'm so excited, man. How are you doing tonight, Quentin? We're pumped. I'm pumped. College football season. Let's go. We're here. We've made it. We got, we got week zero this weekend. Not a whole lot of great games, but hey. I got to say, week begun. zero is like... It's like the equivalent, like it's just a little bit better than NFL preseason to me. Like it's like it's kind of here. It's kind of it's kind of well, here. The last few years they've they've teased us with at least a marginally good game. This year, not only are there really no great games, but the first game kicks off at I think three or no noon, noon Central Time. And then we don't get another game. All the other games, all seven other games, all kick off at the same time at like 6.30, 7 o'clock Wait, Central, really? which is crazy. That is, yeah, we have we have one early kickoff. That's extremely kickoff disappointing. The, yeah, every other game kicks off at the exact same time later in the afternoon. So you don't even get a full day of football. You get you get a game, and then you get about a two-hour like window, and then seven other games. That's that's so disappointing. They they need to call Roger Goodell and get this fixed because he knows how to schedule like a full weekend of football. Yeah, I mean, if Roger Goodell does one thing, it's it's uh, put asses in seats. Yeah, yeah. But we are so today we're we're just we're basically just going to go through every conference briefly for you guys who are watching, and we got some graphics here for you. We got some stats. We got some numbers. We got some recruiting ranks. Some players to watch for the draft next year basically oh, we got it all hold on and we got I have, I have a correction i have a correction we do get utep jacksonville state as, oh thank god so you have navy notre dame at 130 utep jacksonville state at 430 these are central times and then the other five games start between 6 p.m central and 7 30 p.m central Oh, well, that's so, just a waste. My mistake. My mistake to the Jacksonville State fans and UTEP fans. We'll, we'll have our eyes on you at that four thirty slot. Wait, I got, I got, I got a graphic for UTEP actually. Hey, we'll talk about you, UTEP. Yeah, you miners out there, all you miners out there, we got your back. Let's see, miners think. Let's like, just throw it on in here for these folks. People, th- people always seem to think we forget about minors on this podcast. We never forget. About oh minors. no, it's UTSA. That's who I've oh, got. Oh, Roadrunners. Yeah, we got your back too, Roadrunners. Yeah, sorry, so, minors. Sorry, minors. You got forgot we, about again. Yeah. Who's 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 that dude who went super viral on TikTok for about talking about minors? Yeah. Redhead dude with the beard. Uh, uh, Richmond, north of Richmond. I don't know. Oh, sorry. We forgot about the miners. He made a double entendre talking about uh, the the island stuff with old uh, Jerry E. And then actual like coal miners in West Virginia. And it's like the most viral thing on the internet right now. But I can't remember what it, can't remember his name. Oliver Anthony. Sorry, Oliver Anthony. We forgot about the miners. Well, I'm not up on the TikTok trends, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Sorry, Oliver Anthony. But also, sorry, UTEP, because we don't have a graphic for you. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry, guys. It's college football season, and I am so excited. This this is shaping up to be potentially 2007-esque. I mean, a- outside of Georgia, I don't know if you can name three other teams that are a shoe-in for the college football playoff. To where in the past probably half decade, five years, we haven't we've we've known of probably two or three teams that were in the playoff, and it was always like, oh, who's going to get the fourth spot? I mean, this year you can look at every single conference and be like, I wouldn't be surprised if two teams get in here. Yeah, I mean it's. 
I, I, I feel like this is the first year where we're really seeing the full impact of NIL on like transfers yeah. and everything. Like last year we saw plenty of it, but it was like the impact wasn't as big, right? And like yeah. this year, I feel like we're seeing a massive impact from these NIL, the NIL money uh, that is getting these kids to, to move around schools. And it's really cool. If I'm being completely yeah. honest, the parody is like nothing I've ever really noticed in college football. The, these, there are so many teams that are going to be competitive this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And it, I mean, if you keep up with college football to any extent, you look at some of the quarterbacks around the country right now and who they're playing for now, uh, some of the names will shock you on some of the teams. If, if you just loosely follow and you, and you know the names, but you don't follow enough to like see where guys go and stuff. You'll see people on teams that you're like, oh, they're there now. Oh, I mean, it's um, it's silly. The amount, like, over half the quarterbacks are transfers. I feel like, yeah, like uh, uh, the quarterback from Texas, uh, Heard Quinn Ewers, no Heard, uh, Sam Heard. Well, no, it's not his time. Anyway, he's he's at Purdue now. Oh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, you're talking. Um, his what is name. his first name? Last name Heard. No, it's not Heard. It's uh, where are you at? Is it not Heard? H U R D. No, it's uh, that, that's Who's a former quarterback. That, that that's a former UT guy. Am I am I having a stroke right Hudson now? Hudson Card. Card. Oh my! Yeah. I am having a stroke. Hudson yeah, Card. Hudson Card. Hudson Card. The the dude at Texas who was always the dude that was never the dude. That every time uh, another quarterback came in, they were like, "Oh, it's either Hudson Card's job or this guy's job." And it was always the other guy's job. And time and time again, he just got looked over. And whenever he but played, he kept for Texas, coming in and doing great. Yeah, he would he would play just fine. He's at Purdue now. So yeah, where. <laughs> I am. I'm so disappointed in myself. I'm. I'm not on my game right now. The, I feel like t- they did have a quarterback named Hurd once upon a time. Hud. Hud. Hudson. Hud. Hurd. What's yeah, the difference? I mean, I. I've literally been looking at nothing but college football notes all day, and maybe it's just all the names like just <laughs> cycling together in my head. I. Uh, you could have asked me my confidence level in that assertion right there. And I would have said like ninety nine percent. Like I knew for a fact that that was his last name. I just couldn't think of his first name. I strike one by me, and we're not even five minutes into this pod. Well, we'll get through whether it's a twenty we'll strikeout through. game or a two strikeout game. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> you got to swing for it though. Got to got to swing. <laughs> Just like they say in the the Cinderella story, don't let the fear of striking out keep you from playing the game. Am I right? Yeah, you, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't make. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott, Michael Scott, absolutely. But here we are. That was also a quote by Quentin Crisco. So <laughs> you got a three there for go. there. But we'll start with the ACC, and probably. One of the least exciting conferences, but we still have two teams in this conference that most people are pretty confident in that could compete for a shot at the college football playoff. And then you have a couple other teams that could also uh, play spoilers. So we'll start out with Florida State. The, I would say the, are they the favorites or is Clemson the favorites in this conference? Um, I think Florida State's the top dog. Everybody's um, Florida State's yeah. The, Clemson's the new win hot total is nine town. and a half. Florida State's is ten. So Florida State's the new hot girl in town. They got the roster. They got the Jordan Travis. Who, I mean, I, I like Jordan Travis last year, but I mean, I, I know there's a lot to like about this team. I know they have a great roster and everything, but who's their coach now? Is it Mike Norvell still? Mike Norvell. So Mike Norvell is still there as the head coach. I know, oh man, I know Florida State fans are going to see this and just hate me, but 
from what I saw from Jordan Travis last year and Mike Norvell's tenure here at this school, I know there's a ton of talent here, but like, is the talent so much more than it's been in the past three, four years that Mike Norvell has been your head coach the past two years where Jordan Travis has been your quarterback? Like, I, I'm, I'm not seeing the over exaggerated hype that this team is getting over this off season. And I know they're loaded with talent and they probably haven't been this loaded with talent the past four years, but it, I mean, it's Florida state. It's a, what most would consider a blue chip school. Like the talent's always going to be there, but are they going to, are they going to make the jump from a middle of the tier ACC school that is competing for a shot at an ACC championship appearance to a national championship contender? I don't know. What are your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on Florida state? So I'll give you the case for and the case against. And I'll start with the case for. So the case for only lost one player to the NFL last year. So their top end talent has really pretty much stayed year over year, returning 17 starters, including reigning ACC defensive player of the year, possibly the best pass rusher in the country, Jared Verse, coming back. That's a big deal. Um, and on top of that, so you're returning all these guys from last year who are already good, already a 10-win team. Add on the number 19 recruiting class, number 20 recruiting class last year, number 23 the year before, number six transfer class this year. So that's where the infusion of talent is coming from, I think. And that's that's really where you get the case for this team. 10 wins last year, return most of their talent, number six transfer class, three top 25 recruiting classes in a row. Something's got to give here, right? So it, it looks like the, the the it's all moving in the right direction. Now, the case against is pretty simple here. Mike Norvell was one in six against ranked teams at Florida State. And he's lost seven straight games to Clemson. Okay. And then looking at that too, I mean, their entire season lies within the first four games of the season. You open up with LSU, Southern Miss, Boston College should both be walkovers for you. Then you have Clemson before your bye. So, I mean, your entire season rides on essentially going four and zero or two and two. Yeah, that's a good catch. I three mean, and one. Clemson that early is that 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 is tough for them. And then, even if you I lose mean, to LSU, like if you can beat Clemson and still get the shot at the ACC title, like you're, you're still in good shape. And, right. And Florida, Florida, the last game of the season isn't like, I don't, I don't think yeah. Florida's good this year, but Florida has got a lot of young talent on that team. And maybe they figure it out by the end of the season. That's probably the worst time to play Florida because they're probably not playing for anything, but everybody is probably fighting for a starting job the following year. And they got a lot of talent on that Florida team. They're just not very good. So yeah. you could you could see a bunch of hungry freshmen that are four stars, five stars on that Florida team that shouldn't be starting otherwise that are making a case for the transfer portal or something in the future. And then throw in Pitt midway or a little bit more than midway through the season. Pitt's not easy. You have to go to Pittsburgh. That's probably going to be a November, late October game. Um and then followed by Miami. I mean, it's not an easy schedule by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. It doesn't and, break for them very well. Like it's not. It's not. Yeah, they, they don't. Hard, they don't get a break like, anywhere. It's just not well constructed for them. They they have an early buy, and then they don't really get a break after that because after their buy, Virginia Tech, Syracuse, Duke should all be winnable games. But Wake Forest won't be an easy game. And then you go to Pittsburgh, then you come home to Miami, one of the biggest rivalries in college football. Like, and Miami is a team on the rise as well. Uh, then North Alabama throwaway game, but then going to Florida, uh, which, as far as distance and stuff like that, it's not a big deal. But like I said, I mean, it's it's a team that there is talent on that roster. They're not a very good team, but there's going to be a lot of guys fighting for basically auditions, I think, because I, I think their coach is out of it at the end of the season. And I think you see a lot of their guys leave. So, I mean, a lot of I mean, a lot of what you see in that last game against Florida is going to be guys wanting to put stuff on tape to maybe go to an Alabama, to maybe go to a Georgia, to an Oregon, to a USC, to a Ohio State, to a Michigan, 
to even off Florida State. Like it's the NFL. I mean, I yeah. got five names written down here of guys I'm watching this year there for NFL draft purposes. And Jared Verse, who's gonna go top ten most likely. Trinity or Trey Benson at running back, Johnny Wilson at wide receiver, Jaheim Bell at tight end, and Akeem Dent at safety. I mean, that's a good amount of names. What do you think about Jordan Travis? Do you where, do you, do you think he's a first three round guy? Because I've I've seen a lot of hype for him for NFL. I don't I don't know what I don't know what that translates to. I've just seen a lot of NFL guys hype him up, but I don't know if that's like first round hype or if that's like. I think Watch first three rounds. The, yeah, first three rounds sound safe to me. I'm not. I wouldn't go first round unless he does some crazy stuff because he is undersized, but he's electric. Yeah, and he's fearless yeah. out there. He plays like he has nothing to lose, which and you know, we, NFL we've seen we can fall in love with. We, we we've seen college guys make that meteoric rise too. I mean, you yeah. saw Joe Burrow do it going into going into the national championship season. Joe Burrow is probably a fifth round pick, like. Yeah, we've seen guys. I mean, there the were rise, NFL so. scouts after that season who said like Herbert's Herbert's higher on a board, but you can't not take Joe Burrow. <laughs> oh man, I wish I would have seen somebody take Justin Herbert over Joe Burrow. <laughs> yeah, but so so we talked about Florida State a little bit here. So where do you? Where do you think they land here in this conference? Or do, you, do you think? Because I think the ACC is doing two best teams now. I, don't, I, don't, I think they got rid of divisions. Am I correct? Or do you know? I'm not sure. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure they got rid of divisions. I see them falling but, short to Clemson. Like, they'll be the second best team in this conference, I think. I just think Clemson's so going to gonna assuming they get rid of. Assuming, assuming they get rid of divisions, you think it's them versus Clemson in the ACC championship? Yeah. I agree. So, we'll go to the next team, which I assume is Clemson here. Yes, sir. Dabo. All right. Clemson. Uh, the cult of the ACC. They are the Texas A&M of the ACC. You have the Dabo cult going on there in uh, South Carolina, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is my geography right there? I can't keep up with the su- southern states. But none of these dang schools use the state name in their name. It, it makes no <laughs> sense. But yeah, you you have you have the Texas AM of South Carolina here with Clemson. Uh everybody worshiping the 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 feet that Dabo walks on. But a lot to like about this Clemson team, and they seem to be kind of forgotten powerhouse in college football these past couple of years. Yeah, DJ Uigalele, Uigalali. Uh, sorry, Washington State. I think State, the word you're I'm looking not, for not, is ukulele, like the little guitar. Ukulele. Sorry, Washington State. I'm not going to get your quarterback's name right, but um, yeah. A lot of hope for him after that Notre Dame game a couple years ago. Didn't really seem to pan out. Now you have Cade Klubnick coming in. Uh, badass out of Texas High School football. I think he was Lake Travis. Or Yeah, I believe Heather so. Park. Either way. Badass coming out of Texas High School football. Um, I expect big things out of this guy. And as you would assume... It's a loaded roster. It's Clemson. It's Dabo. Um, I have much more faith in this Clemson team being able to run that conference over Florida State. Um, mainly because Dabo is a proven coach. I mean, go back to the Taj Boyd era where Clemson wasn't the best team in the conference. And they were still competing for conference titles with Taj Boyd and Dabo. And on to the Deshaun Watson era, on to the Trevor Lawrence era, whatever it is. I mean, all they've done is compete, compete, compete. And they've had three down years since the departure of Trevor Lawrence. But I, I, I feel like way too many people are sleeping on Clemson right now. They they might be the sleeping giant of college football right now. Yeah. So, again, I'll give you the case four. I'll start that way. Case four. DJ Ugalay lays out. Cade Klubnik, bowl game hero last year, right? Showed up in the bowl game, did his thing, took them to a victory, balled out, 
look great. He's the chosen one. He's the next guy. And, you know, all the, the DJ ukulele problems, we got a new offensive coordinator now. Riley's in the building. We got this big, big two-headed rushing attack with Shipley and Maffa in the backfield. And also, I have, gonna to be- just give a, I have to give a quick apology to all the all the high school Cade K- Klubnik fans out there. He went to Westlake. Uh, and I, uh, I know a lot of people, if they heard me say Lake Travis, would probably kill me. So sorry to the Westlake fans. He's, he's definitely from Austin Westlake, not Lake Travis. So I apologize for that. Okay. And on defense, like you, you can sit here and say, oh, they lost Miles Murphy. They lost Brian Brzee, Trenton Simpson, KJ Henry. There's a lot of talent in the front seven. This team still got Jeremiah Trier Jr. Still got Barrett Clark. Still got the best name in college football, Rook Aurora. And Tyler Davis on the D line. Like that, this this defense still has plenty of talent. Now, if you want to take the pessimistic route, case against the really what that wide receiver was it really a dj ukulele problem or was it a receivers can't separate problem and yeah. how much how confident are we in this new offensive coordinator to get that figured out um yeah. i think this defense is still going to be good pretty much no matter what it's a it's a question about the offense and if club nick is the fix if riley's the fix if a receiver can step up that that's where my where i'm looking to to find that out quickly in this season um, I don't know how to phrase this without sounding ridiculous, but they might be the widest team in college football, and that's including Wisconsin. Yeah, was it, <laughs> hey, Wisconsin's got some new stuff going on, man. Yeah, but <laughs> it's one of those things like <laughs> hard not to notice. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Will Shipley, like, I love you, but it's like you're not Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> not quite. So, um, but a lot of talent everywhere on this team. And like I said, I mean, proven coach. Uh, who, who's the new OC? Garrett Riley? Yeah. Lincoln Riley's little brother, Texas Tech grad. Wreck him. Um, but, yeah, lots to like about this team. I mean, to me, to me, they're they're the team to beat in the ACC, in my opinion, and I expect them to to win this conference and and go on to the college football playoff. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking the same thing. Uh, you want to take a look at North Carolina or Pitt before we move along? Yeah, we'll we'll look at North Carolina and Pitt, and then everybody else in the ACC. I'm sorry, but we don't have the time. So North Carolina, you have. You have a quarterback in Drake May, who is not related to me, unfortunately, but he has the chance to solidify himself as either a top three pick or not go until day three of the draft here. Uh, I mean, I think he's probably going first round pretty much no matter what. You think no matter what? Pretty much. I mean, unless he just... They said the same thing. I said the same thing sucks. about Sam Howell. I mean, I don't know. Sam Sam Howell didn't have an arm like this kid. I don't know. But anyway, uh, lots to like about this. About this offense. But, I mean, ever since Matt Brown has took over the job at UNC, their defense has been abysmal. So, like, let, let, let me throw some terrible. numbers at you for that. ACC average, teams give up 24 and a half points a game. North Carolina last year, 31 points a game. ACC average, 360 yards a game. North Carolina, 436 yards a game. ACC average, negative 0.14 EPA per play allowed. North Carolina average, positive 0.175 EPA per play allowed. Like, that's a ludicrous differential. Yeah, I mean, their defense has not been good. One good thing about their schedule is they do not play Florida State. They don't play Clemson until late in the season. Their biggest their biggest rivalry game, NC State, is the last game of the season. They do have South Carolina early, which could 
I mean, that could be make or break farm right there. But they get out of that game. App State's tough. Minnesota's kind of tough. But, I mean, they're definitely winnable. And then at Pittsburgh is also definitely a winnable game. But then after that, Syracuse, Miami, Virginia, Georgia Tech. You get through that Miami game, and, I mean, you're rolling from then on. Georgia Tech might be one of the worst teams in the or, and all of college football. Virginia might be one of the worst teams in all of college football. Campbell, I – you could you could pay me a thousand dollars. I I couldn't tell you where Campbell is. I'm sorry. And it's in, uh, Donovan McNam McNabb's mom's kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> Junk, chunky soup, baby. <laughs> and then uh, I I don't think Duke's going to be very good this year. So I mean they they got to get through their first four games and the last two, and then I think everything in between. Outside of the Miami game, Miami's tricky. Miami might be good this year. But I think Miami is one year away from being back. So at best, I would, I would I would put Miami at Frisky this year, which Frisky might be good enough to trip up one of these top three or four teams. So definitely not, not give them that Miami win, but it's a game they should win. So you just got to get through that early schedule and that late schedule, and we could see – we, we, we could see some fireworks late in the season, the ACC, if that happens. Yeah, I mean, if if their defense figures anything out, they, they just switch D coordinators to Gene Chizik. So maybe he oh. has some answers, but like... Yeah, does he have Cam Newton's phone number? <laughs> I mean, I bet he does, probably. <laughs> uh, uh, it's probably not even a good idea. That defense is terrible, that Auburn team. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, but it, it's all going to be shootouts here. I mean, unless, unless this defense just like turns a corner fast, which I mean, they had really good recruiting classes in 21, 22. Maybe they had talent that was developing. I'm not 100% sure on that. But the, I mean, they just lost a decent amount of talent to the NFL on offense. So none of the defensive guys were leaving. It doesn't seem like returning 68% of their production on defense last year. But losing Josh Downs and Antoine Green, I'm interested to see how that impacts this pass game. Yeah, and I mean, so you think Drake May has solidified himself as the number two quarterback behind Caleb Williams in this draft class? Or I think he solidified himself as a first round player. Like someone might be able to jump him as number two, but I don't think he's getting out of the first round. Cowboys, come get him, boy. All right. Uh, we'll go on to the Pittsburgh. Are they the Panthers, right? Yep. Hail the Pit. Up these college mascots. I got a Pit hat. Almost, almost, here. My wife almost your hometown team. Yeah. Kind of almost. Just like a six hour drive away. Yeah. I forget for the Northeast, that's really far. For, for Texas, six hours, you're like, oh, yeah, that's my team. <laughs> yeah, everyone in Dallas is just like the Red Raiders. That's my squad. That's my squad. <laughs> there, you can go six hours and you can pick fourteen different college teams. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but well, I could pick fourteen teams without leaving the the general Philly area. <laughs> well, we're talking about Power Five here. Yeah. Okay, so we got Pat Narduzzi. Which seems like he's been here for 20 years at this point. Been a very solid program uh, during his era, but they've really never taken that next step. They they had the Kenny Pickett era. They had the Jordan Addison era with Kenny Pickett, and then he transferred off to USC to go be buddy-buddy with all the honeys down in USC and Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams, which... Who can blame him? Um, Who did they bring in last year? Was it Kadon Slovis? Keaton Slovis last yeah, year? Yeah, it was Slovis. Yeah, that didn't work out. Um, he's somewhere else but now. Who, yeah, he's Big 12? I think so. I forget. I can't where. keep up. Can't keep up with these quarterbacks. It's a wild uh, who's, their quarter, who's their quarterback this year? Phil Jerkovich. He's Jerkovich. I love Jerkovich last year at Boston College. Everybody at Boston College will tell you he sucked because... 
he wasn't good last year at Boston College. Boston College wasn't good last year. I expect he's him to make a... He's had a rough career. It's just like up and down, like extremes. There's no in between yeah. with him. Yeah. I mean, if if you talk to Boston College fans, they, they'll say, glad he's gone. And then he's going to go out and ball out for Pitt. And they're like, oh, we knew he was that good. We knew that was going to happen. It's, it's not like the Baker Mayfield situation at Tech at all. No. Nah. We, we don't talk about that. But... <laughs> I, I like Jerkovich in this offense, and I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, Jerkovic OC at Boston College is now the OC at Pitt, unless I'm getting things confused. I don't know if you can fact check me on that. I'm not sure on that one. I don't From know. Two off years top ago. Of my head. I don't know it off the top of my head. When he had his um, good season. I could be wrong. I know one of these quarterbacks is back with their OC from two years ago after they did not have a good year last year. And I want to say it was Jerkovic, but it could have also been one of seven other quarterbacks that I looked at earlier. (laughs) There's a lot Um, to get through with these transfers. There is. Uh, I'm telling you, it's I should have made notes. Furious in those transfer portals. At the time when I was doing it, I'm like, "Oh, I remember that. That's easy." And then the more I looked, oh, "Oh, it's Frank Signetti Jr. This guy's been everywhere. Forget. Um, let's see. So he he was yep, Boston College. He's been everywhere, man. So So Jerkovich's best year a year ago. He was the OC. I I I threw together because I'm I'm a damn psychopath i threw together some spreadsheet of just like every coaching tree that's active in the nfl down to like the position coaches and frank signetti jr is on almost on every single tree. nfl coaching tree like it's insane yeah. like Let pittsburgh iup kansas city new orleans fresno state north carolina 49ers cal pitt Rutgers, rams Giants, Packers, Boston College, back at Pitt again. <laughs> He's been everywhere. Journey- it's the journeyman of OCs. <laughs> Frank Signetti Jr., man. Frank Signetti Jr. But <laughs> I think there's a lot to like about this team. And if there's a team that's going to jump up and bite you in the ass that's not Miami, it's Pitt. Yeah, I can – man, I don't – I mean, I could believe that Jerkovic could bounce back. I could see that. And with his, I mean, he's got arm talent and he's fearless. So, like, I could definitely see that happening. They just they lost a lot in their front seven, and I need to see it because with the, where the recruiting ranks have been, fifty first this year, seventy sixth the year before, not really doing a whole lot in the transfer portal. That's that that's standing out. You just lost Elijah Cansey, Carter or. On defense, Kalijah Cansey and uh, Habakkuk Baldonado, who I thought was a really good production player for them. Like, so yeah. that really impacts your D line. Plus, Carter Warren at offensive tackle, Izzy Abanaconda at running back, uh, Servosha Dennis at linebacker. Th- that's just a lot. Six whole players, like, six entire players got drafted last year for them. But so I need to see that talent replicate because I don't see it in the recruiting ranks. When, when you look at this team's schedule, okay, so the North Carolina game, it's about the same for them as it was North Carolina, except for the fact that North Carolina is really the only tough game on their schedule until they see Florida State later, or until they see Notre Dame, excuse me, uh, about week eight. Uh, but Warf- Warford, Cincinnati is not going to be good. West Virginia is going to be one of the worst teams in the nation. Uh, then you have North Carolina, Virginia Tech's one of the worst teams in the nation. Louisville, who they're going to be a middle of the pack ACC team, but I wouldn't say it's a team Pitt has to worry about. Wake Forest is kind of in that same conversation, and then Notre Dame. If they beat no, if they beat North Carolina, they're going to be a top ten team going into that Notre Dame game. And if they can roll Notre Dame, Florida State back to back weeks, you're talking about a very legitimate threat to either Pitt making the college football playoff or them playing spoiler and nobody getting out of the ACC. Yeah. I mean, you're, you, 
make a great point on their schedule. Like you could be easily looking at seven and zero or six and zero going into that Notre Dame game, and then things start to get interesting. Yeah, but I think I think Pitt could be the make it or break it team for this entire conference. Because I could see them beating Notre Dame and Florida State and then going on and losing Syracuse, Boston College. Then that gives Florida State two losses. But then Florida State goes on to beat Clemson. And then Clemson drops a game. And then we're sitting at the college football playoff. And there's not an ACC team to be found. (laughs) It would be something, man. It would be something. But, yeah, as of right now, I think I'm gonna have Clemson in it, but we'll we'll wait till we get through all the conferences and do our our four playoff teams. All right, so moving on, we got the Big Ten, aka the Big, the Big Ten. Twelve. Probably might be the most top heavy conference in the in the nation. I don't think there's a conference. Actually, I know there's not a conference with three better teams than the top three teams in this conference. I don't know if any other conference can stand up with Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State as a top three. And then with Michigan, Indiana, and Maryland being the next three after that, this may be the toughest conference in the in the entire nation this year. But we'll dig into it with Michigan here. Uh, Big Ten champs last year, Big Ten champs the year before that. Uh, it looks like Harbaugh has finally got this thing pumping and rolling here at Michigan. And I was listening to a college football podcast two days ago. Shout out Brandon Walker with Unnecessary Roughness, uh, Barstool Sports. He made a great analogy that I hadn't thought of. But when he said it, I was like, that's spot on. And he said... Michigan is built to beat Ohio State while Ohio State is built to win national championships. And I don't know if a truer, truer words have ever, ever been spoken. Yeah, I can. I mean, that that's very well put. Harbaugh knew exactly what he was building this team for, and he did it. Yeah, he like. I wouldn't be surprised if they beat Ohio State again this year, and Ohio State might be one of the best teams in the country. But I, I don't see them standing up and competing for a national championship. Yeah, I, man, it's it, it's just kind of hard to think that they will after like what happened against TCU last year, right? Like they have TCU had no of, business of, winning that game. Out of the big three in the Big Ten, they by far have the easiest schedule. So they play, uh, they basically don't play anybody until Penn State week, what is that, nine, 10? I mean, their schedule is the last three weeks of the season Penn, yeah. at Penn State, at Maryland, and then Ohio State at home. Like, if they drop a game before then, their season's completely over, in my opinion. Like, their entire season lies in their last three weeks at Penn State, at Maryland, and then Ohio State at home. Yeah, I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, you, they lost nine players to the draft, but I don't, I'm not too worried about their yeah, green okay. class is always Tell top 20. I mean, it's going to come down to JJ McCarthy. For, they had a top five, five transfer class this year. And yeah, I agree. It's it's it's, it's kind of on McCarthy. He needs to take that step and uh, really match the talent around him. You know, if be, he needs to be elevating players, not be the one being elevated. And they're gonna have they're gonna have probably the best running back room in the nation. Um, yeah. Blake Corum's still there, and uh, the other two running backs are just escaping me at the moment, but. Uh, yeah, like I mean, they forum and uh, Donovan Edwards. I don't know. The Donovan name. Edwards. There we go. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they they shouldn't have any. They should absolutely steamroll every opponent on their schedule. 
I'm sorry, Rutgers. I'm sorry, Nebraska. I'm sorry, Minnesota. I'm sorry, Indiana. I'm sorry, Michigan State. Y'all suck. Like, Michigan is absolutely going to steamroll everybody and probably not going to have to throw the ball much. You're probably not going to have to see much from J.J. McCarthy until we hit that Penn State game. But yeah. that last three-game stretch, we're going to see what J.J. McCarthy's made of, and we'll see. I mean, it's put your nuts on the table and prove it time. That's all there yeah. is to it. Yeah. I mean, this you actually you get a pretty wide array of opinions on this team. Like AP poll has him as, as number two, PFF has him at number three, twenty four seven puts him at twenty, and FPI has him at six, and the coaches poll has him back at two. Like that, that feels like a pretty wide range for a team that is Out- ranked two by anyone. Outside of the twenty, I mean, it, I would say that's consensus top three, top four team at worst. Um, and but like I said. We haven't seen them perform well against top flight opponents outside of the the Big Ten. And the analogy that I heard, I mean, they're built to beat Ohio State. And Ohio State's built to win national championships. And even though Ohio State hasn't won a national championship in recent memory, I mean, they took one of the best college football teams we've seen in a long time in Georgia last last year down to the wire, down to a, a last-second field goal. When we hadn't oh, seen anybody push somebody. Georgia, and they they pretty well handled Ohio State last year, and they got beat by they they got beat by TCU. So yep. I don't know. All right. Well, speaking of them Buckeyes, the Buckeyes how about Ryan Day squad. Oh man! So. You know me, but I'm one Buckeye fan in Texas. <laughs> I mean, I, I still love this team. I, I think I think their defense is going to be much improved this year. They have the best wide receiver room in the country, bar none. I mean, I think they have they have a top both the 20. top two receivers in next year's draft. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say they they have a top twenty wide receiver room if their wide receiver room was in the NFL. Yeah. Like, yeah, like Marvin Harrison Jr. right now would be a top fifteen at worst wide receiver in the NFL. To make that argument, I, I don't even think it's an argument. I think that's just fact. I don't know if you can name fifteen better receivers in the NFL better than Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I think but... fifteen. I, I'd give you twenty easily. Fifteen, I might start to push back a little. But, I mean, you, you look at some of the guys that played with him. I mean, he's better than Garrett Wilson. How, how good is Garrett Wilson in the NFL? Uh, 15 to 20. Right in there. He's better than Chris Olave. Where was Chris Olave in that list? Probably right around the Same? Yeah, yeah, same so, range. Oh, yeah, really. I mean, right there. I mean, yeah, I, I think he's top 15. Anyway, regardless, best wide receiver core in – College football, yeah. bar none. It's, it's not debatable on that. Um, don't know who their quarterback's going to be, but are we really worried about an Ohio State quarterback in this day and age? I'm it's not. Tate Martell. He's been Tate, training for like six years. It could be Tate Martell, and I still wouldn't be worried. That's how good this offense is going to be. Yeah. Uh, Trevion Henderson, who was one of the best returning backs last year in college football, had an injury-ridden season. Didn't see a whole lot from him. I expect big, big, big things out of Trevion Henderson this year. Um, should have a very good offensive line, very good defensive line. I think this could be the year Ohio State's back. Um, the only reason why I'm pumping the brakes is about the team we're going to talk about next. But talking strictly about Ohio State, I think I think they're better than Michigan. I think they're going to beat Michigan in the big house this year. And they might have the most top flight talent in all of college football. Like they're going to have, they're, they're littered with first round picks, but where they're weak, they're, they're pretty weak at, but I still think they're good enough to where 
looking at their schedule, I mean, Notre Dame's tough, tough, tough week four game. And then at Purdue, Maryland, and Penn State, that three-game stretch after the bye definitely isn't easy. Um, Maryland with Talia Tungavaloa, I mean, they should be better this year. I mean, they've been progressively getting a a little – They've been progressively getting a little better every year. Talia's been there, though. Um, And then they have to go to Wisconsin. Wisconsin's going to be a tough, tough out this year. Uh, Mm -hmm. Ending the season at at Michigan. Um, And then having having Penn State, Wisconsin, Maryland, and Purdue all in that four-game stretch right after Notre Dame. I mean, they got a dogfight of a schedule, which usually Ohio State's one of those teams that – has a schedule kind of like what Michigan has this year where they just kind of walk through until somebody's there. So this is going to be one of the most battle-tested teams we've seen in a long time going into that uh, rivalry game in Michigan at the end of the year. So I'm really excited to see what this Ohio State team does. And they could very well shit the bed. They could lose two or three games this year, but I'm not seeing it. I mean – I think I think the schedule comes down to Notre Dame, Penn State, and Michigan, which, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm kind of speaking the obvious there, but I, I think that I think I think they live and die by those three games. Yeah, I mean, I the difference between this being an underwhelming squad and a title contender comes down to a handful of plays from the quarterback, whether that's Kyle McCord or Devin Brown, who knows. But that's what it's going to come down to. I mean, the only other spot that I'm worried about on this team is they're replacing. They have three new stars along the offensive line because three guys got drafted. But I mean, again, this is a team that's churning out top five recruiting classes year in year out. The talent's there, and not only top five recruiting classes, guys that are going on to be high draft picks. Yeah. In the NFL, and so I mean, this, they're they're this, developing guys on top of because you could you could look at a bunch of teams historically that have high uh, recruiting classes, but you never see it translate. Like these guys are translating into top mm-hmm. end NFL talent. They got, I think it's twelve guys projected to go in the draft next year. That's a ludicrous number. It could be like six, no. as high as sixteen or eighteen if you include early early declares. Like, no. it's just stupid how talented this team is. It, but the quarterback is a big question mark right now. Yeah, very much so. And Kyle McCord was the heavily projected starter until like three or four days ago. So I don't know what's going on with that. I don't know if it's just smoke, but we'll see. We'll I mean, he's see a five star. I don't, I don't know about Devin Brown. I assume he's a five star if he's a quarterback at Ohio State. Like, it's usually that four simple. star. Four star. I think. Okay. I think Kyle McCord was a five star. Brown yeah, was. was a four star, but he was a four star that a lot of people thought should have been a five star, and that a lot of people are high on. Okay, interesting. And they, a lot of people thought he got kind of screwed in the recruiting rankings. There you go, Ryan Day's pulling the old switcheroo right before the season starts. Yeah, so we will see. But yeah, I'm 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 big on Ohio State. Uh, Looking at their win total, 10 and a half, probably not touching it, but I do love this Ohio State team. But we can go on to, I'm assuming Wisconsin is going to be your next graphic here. Penn State. Oh, Penn State, the yeah. Nittany Penn Lions. State. I meant to say Penn State. I am ex- I was looking at the schedule and said Wisconsin. Penn State, I mean, James Franklin, nut up or shut up time. I mean, this is, this is the year, I mean – Michigan's at the top of their game. Ohio State's at the top of their game. And you might have the best team in the conference. I mean, if there's ever been a time for you to prove everybody in Philadelphia wrong, everybody in Pennsylvania wrong, everybody in the nation that talks about you like you're not the guy, that you shrivel up in big games, that you can't get it done, this is your time. You're not that guy, pal. You're not that guy. This is your time, James Franklin. When everybody said you should have took the Stanford job, when everybody has been giving you shit because you can't get it done, even though you've just been winning nine, ten games a year for the past four or five years, 
now is your time because I think this might be the best team in the Big Ten. They got a shot. I mean, this this kid they got a quarterback, Drew Alar, is supposed to be supposed to be a dude. Like, when's the last time we saw a dude playing quarterback at Penn State? Trace McSorley? Was was that a dude? <laughs> was that a guy? He had a song? That was just a guy. I'm talking about a dude, yeah. a guy who you watch throw the football and you just like are in awe of the way Sean that Clifford? ball flies through space. What? Sean Clifford? <laughs> <laughs> you, you mean Green Bay Packers legend Sean Clifford? Yeah. It, he very well, you might, might want to bite your tongue on that because he very well may be the next Green Bay legend. If Sean Clifford works out there, I. I don't know a thing anymore. I'm just no, lost. I'm lost yeah, at sea. So, Drew Allard, I mean, he is he's got a lot of expectations riding on him, but yeah, he looks good. Um, pretty favorable schedule. I mean, considering you have to play both Ohio State and Michigan, pretty favorable schedule here. You go to Ohio State, but you got Michigan at home. You end the season at Rutgers and Michigan State. You open up the season in West Virginia, who might be the worst team in the nation. Delaware, who we're not worried about that. Illinois, are not worried about that. Iowa could be tough. Good defense. But Iowa hasn't scored more than... Iowa hasn't scored double digits since, like, the, the Truman era. Um... And then you have Northwestern, UMass. I mean, it's it's Ohio State, Michigan. Yeah. And you could either be the spoiler or to the spoils go the victor here. <laughs> to the spoils go the victor. I like it. You caught that? <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean – this is a team where I, I look at the guys that they drafted or that they lost the NFL draft. I mean, Porter's going to hurt. He was locked down for them. And Brett and Strange did a lot of interesting stuff for them on offense. Um, but really with Strange, Scruggs, uh, those two, I feel like they'll it's be hard to lose to a guy named Drew Scruggs. The name is outstanding. Don't get That's, me wrong. It's a hard loss. But Jair Brown – and Joey Porter are the two guys who would worry me more that they lost um, just because those secondary guys were really good for them. But they replicate the talent here. They they have they have the talent coming in in recruiting classes. And, I mean, you still got Alou Fashanu, probably going top 10 this year. You got Chop Robinson with one of the best names in college football. It's an awesome, awesome football player. Um there's just a lot to like here. And I think that they'll, I think that they're going to be pretty darn good. Yeah. I mean, like I said, we were talking before the podcast and I might be able to make it down for that Michigan game. And this is your hometown team now. So, I mean, I know you're like diehard Nittany lion, like uh, grew up at happy Valley going to all the games. Joe Paul is your favorite coach ever. And I was like, oh, well, we go tailgate that Michigan game. Like, oh, we might, we might have to do a live podcast from oh yeah, from the tailgate. Yeah, we would definitely have to. Uh, but and I, know that's I don't team. know what you're talking about. The hometown team is Temple, my dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Villanova? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. It's Nova. <laughs> do they play football? Technically? I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, 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 if they do, I don't they know did. if I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so, no, I'm very, very excited for this team. Uh, you want to do you want to do Wisconsin, then move on? Yeah. So, we talked about spoilers in the ACC. This is the spoiler of the Big Ten. If, if, all chaos happens. Wisconsin's going nine and two, uh, ten and one. They are good yeah. enough to absolutely put a wrench in all of this. 
and ruin the big Big Ten's hopes and dreams this year. I think Penn State's good enough to compete for a national title. I think Michigan's good enough to compete for a national title. And I think Ohio State's good enough to compete for a national title. And I think this team is good enough to keep them all out of the playoff. I can see it. <laughs> like, Tanner Mordecai coming in. SMU, I believe. Um, yep. And Oklahoma. Was he Oklahoma? Oklahoma, then SMU. I then Wisconsin. I don't remember. I don't remember the Oklahoma days. I'm uh, sorry, Lincoln Riley. I don't remember Tanner Mordecai playing for you, but he might not have played, but he committed there. It, yeah. So Tanner Mordecai out of SMU going, going up to the big apple of uh, Wisconsin and new coach coming in, Luke Fickle. There could be some changes. Bring the air raid That'll... offense to Madison, Wisconsin, man. <laughs> They're gonna it's be wild times, wild yeah. times, and they still have maybe the best running back in the nation. And in a year where this might be the best running back year of college football that we've seen since like the Reggie Bush era, like there are running backs all over the country, and they still might have the best running back here on this team with Braylon Allen. Um, yeah. It is it is insane the the talent they have. There it's Wisconsin. They're gonna have a, a, a very, very good offensive line, defensive line. They're gonna play they good defense. One they lost their center and their nose tackle. Like outside of that, they're returning almost everybody. Yeah. And, and they and, lost an edge too. But like that seventy two percent of the production last year is coming back. And they're going to be taking shots. And Tanner Mordecai ain't scared. I don't know how much SMU you watched last year. Tanner Mordecai's not scared. He'll sling it with anybody, boy. Playing at SMU, you just can't be scared. He'll sling it with anybody, boy. So I mean, this this is the team that you could look at at the end of the season and be like, why aren't there any Big Ten teams? And that playoff graphic, and it's because all Wisconsin went, went and beat Ohio State, and but but they lost to a Purdue, or they lost to a Rutgers, or they lost to an Illinois, and then Ohio Buffalo. State goes and one. yeah, then Ohio State goes and beats a Michigan, but then also loses to Penn State, and Penn State loses to a Michigan while beating in Ohio State and then you have all the top end teams with one or two losses and at the end of the year it would be like one of those things where it's like one, two, three, four, four different conferences and then like five through nine is all big ten teams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I see I, it man. This gonna, team's gonna be gonna wild. Be I'm excited to watch this team. I am this absolutely is, excited. This is one of my favorite totals, actually. Like, I'm not a big total guy, but over seven wins. Oh, there it's nine. Yeah. Uh, I still At like them over nine wins. Though. At plus yeah, 125, though. I still like them. Like, 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 so, I mean, and they have one of the best schedules in the entire country. I mean, their season is basically Ohio State. They're probably going to be favored in every single other game outside Ohio State. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I I don't know who else are dogs to looking at this. Maybe at Purdue, but that'll be the last time they're underdogs if they win that game. Yeah. Other than Ohio State. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, North, Northwestern's terrible. Nebraska's terrible. This is going to be a fun Minnesota's team. Minnesota's terrible. So. This is going to be yeah, a fun very, team. very fun team. Big very, Ten's getting very fun. fun Watch out. And. I, I very much expect them to be in the in the Big Ten championship, and to this is the team that's going to ruin all the all the dreams of a Big Ten championship this year, I believe. All right, and so, if they don't, Penn State's getting in. You want to talk Iowa? We can talk Iowa. All right, let's get some Kirk Ferentz on in here. Did he fired his son yet? I don't know. I think so. I think I remember seeing that. Is it who? Who's the? I, I got to look up who's their. If their offensive coordinator is still a son, then I have nothing to say about this team. 
<laughs> um, I don't know. They're under the gambling probe, though. Yeah. Well, yeah, their <laughs> the, their kicker was taking unders, and the the game that he bet on, they went over. <laughs> is that right? I didn't get. They that. hit. Yeah, it's still Brian Ferentz. Yeah, Brian Ferentz is still their OC. Um, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna score seven points a game and allow six and but win. They got Kate games. McNamara. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you don't if you don't pass the ball. All right, moving on to the long. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything else to say, but <laughs> there's not. I got nothing else to say on Iowa. They they screwed me on like three different overs last year that I lost by like one point each. Yeah, you I, see, I, I got yeah. nothing else to say on. That. You see, like an Iowa Purdue game, and it's like the overs like seventeen. You're like, well, I'm gonna hammer that. Yeah. <laughs> Like, then, why wouldn't ends, I take over ends nine five? Yeah, it yeah. Ends nine five, and you're like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> Everybody else is just sitting there, like, "Told you." And I hate well, betting we, overs, and I did we, it. We, and they kept we live on getting safeties. Me. We live on safeties around here, boy. <laughs> That's the way Iowa All football right. does it. So we'll go to the Big 12. We'll go to the the class of the Big 12, I should say, with the University of Texas Longhorns with Kit Quinn Ewers at the helm. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian coming in. To, is it year two or year three for start? Year three. Year three for start. So the year before they go to the SEC, they're heavy, 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 heavy favorites to win the Big 12. My, I was talking to a Texas fan today at work and they Not haven't really performed it I don't go to Walmart but there's plenty of fans <laughs> there um, they haven't really lived up to expectations since Sarkeesian got there and I was asking him today he's, since he's way pretty, before that well um, I'm talking strictly Sark era and he's, he's a pretty Realistic, honest Texas fan. Shout out, Epi. Uh, Epi Dominguez. Um, he, I, I asked him. I said, if Texas loses four games this year, do they risk firing Sark and losing Arch Manning? Or do they just keep running it back and saying, you got the guys, like, let's see what happens. And he said he thinks if they lose four games or more he would say fire him and if arch leaves he leaves and to me i think arch is worth way too much money and the powers that be at texas would rather lose four games and keep arch manning rather than compete for a national title and lose arch manning and i just want to know your thoughts on that i agree I wish someone had stepped in at Texas Tech and said, "We're not flat. We're not firing Cliff. Mahomes is too important to this program." Yeah. Well, like it's Cliff as simple was there as that. The whole Mahomes if, era. Yeah, but it, but the year he was fired was the same year that oh. Mahomes won MVP, and yeah. at that point, Texas Tech would have been able to get just about any quarterback in the country they want. Yeah, they were an icon. Yeah. And uh, they didn't really make a very good hire after that either. So we could have been in the same spot we're at now no, with, uh, without Fire and Cliff. So and I, I love the guy, or I didn't love him, but I, I rooted for him. I don't even remember his name anymore because Joey McGuire is that dude. But uh, what, uh, Wells? Yeah, uh, Matt Wells. Sonny Wells. Matt Wells. There we go. Sorry, Matt Wells. I hope you're doing well. I really do. <laughs> I hope you're. <laughs> I hope you're doing great, Matt Wells. I really hey, and truly do. Matt Wells gave us really... Tyree Wilson. So. <laughs> he technically did. Technically. Um, um, but, yeah, shout out to Matt Wells. But, so, looking at this Texas program, uh, you have Quinn Ewers, who, what, what, I, I don't really follow draft talk until closer to the draft. What is his draft stock looking like right now? Third round pick. He's a project. 
He's a major project. I mean, realistically, yeah. if he has a decent year, he's probably looked at as a late first to second round pick. But really? like, a lot of it depends on his mechanics, to be honest, and how much they improve you. I mean, he year. hasn't really put a whole lot on film, I guess. I mean, he redshirted. I mean, I mean, this, he's, he's just this... arm talent at this point. Like, he is yeah. so raw as a passer. Like, it, it's just you're betting on pure upside. That's all you're betting on. And he's undersized. He's been hurt a lot. Like, there's a lot of risks there with him. Yeah, I mean, if he hadn't have left high school early, this would be his true sophomore season. So, I mean, he's still very, very young. Mm-hmm. What? So, what do you think Texas does if they do have a good year? Let's say, let's say they win the Big Twelve and lose one game, and somehow it breaks their way to where they don't make the national championship, but they only lose one game. They, they win their, they have a big bowl game versus let's say Ohio state. They win that. And then Quinn Ewers is like, I want to come back for another year. Does it depends how key Ewers was to all that. That would be my main state. If I think he's going to be pretty damn good. If Ewers, well, I mean you do, but like also like there's different levels. You know, if like if yours is balling oh, yeah. out and he's looking like a first round top half of the first round type guy and he says he's coming back, you got to stick with him and let let Arch Manning walk to Lubbock. Like that, uh, that's what you got to do. <laughs> imagine. <laughs> imagine, uh, imagine Peyton Manning going to Lubbock <laughs> to watch his nephew play. Watch it. Watch it happen. Oh, God. Don't get me excited, but <laughs> um, <laughs> just the just the thought of Arch Manning <laughs> playing Lubbock <laughs> is hilarious. It's, he would it's... never have to wait the Chibi's line. Never. <laughs> God no. <laughs> would never wait any line. They would they would shut down Broadway. <laughs> Police just so he court. can yeah but... for his lime scooter. Yeah, but. <laughs> No, looking at this Texas team, I mean, I was big on Texas last year. I was wrong, but I mean, I think I think they're better this year than they were last year. And you look at this, look at this schedule, and they go to Alabama, Brad Denny, week two. But after that, I mean, Baylor may be tough. I, I don't have a whole lot of faith in Baylor this year. Kansas will be tough, but. I mean, should handle them pretty easily. I think Oklahoma is going to be dog shit. Like, I mean, out last year I said Oklahoma is going to win seven games, and I got shit on by a lot of people, and they only won six. So, um, and they got beat forty nine nothing to Texas. So, I, I'm not worried about Texas in that game versus Oklahoma. Houston might be one of the worst teams in the Big Twelve. Oh, here we go. You can go back to it. What? Oh, was it showing up? Go, I didn't see it on my end. Yeah. Oh, it showed up for Harold. a second. Yeah. Where'd it you go? see it? Nah, right. The sec- it, it popped up. Uh, Hang on. I got oh, you. It's all gone. Just keep talking. Uh, I was looking at their schedule, but um, Houston's not going to be very good. I mean, their, their biggest game of the seasons are Texas Tech, the very last game of the season, and... Alabama week two, and I think if they get the, through those two games, they're playing for a Big Twelve championship. So, um, yeah, our dude so, Harold, our, our boy Harold, uh, this guy immediately disqualifies himself from any basic. No, it, we're talking about me talking about Oklahoma last year, saying they're going to win seven to eight games. He said Venables was run out of OU for bad defense, which was true. Uh, they, they, basically hard and feathered him in the streets on his way out of town the first time they fired him but hey Einstein Venables left because it was Mike Stoops imposing defensive schemes so it was the head coach calling the defense instead of the defensive coordinator and then they scapegoated the defensive coordinator out of town is what this guy's saying um and uh Britton didn't know how to fit the talents shaving points podcast is bogus um so sorry Harold I, I don't know what I'm talking about because I was I was very factually incorrect last year when I said uh, uh, OU was going to win seventy eight get seven to eight games. It should, took everything we, they had. Jay, to- should should we just admit that we uh, 
were half wit mental midgets, media wannabes spouting falsehoods, like Harold accused out of our parents' basement. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely in my parents' basement. Uh, one of my parents lives with with his parent, and the other one also lives with their parent, and they live in their parents' basements. And I, I've I, I I was basically homeless at, since sixth grade, so I, I'm no longer homeless, and I I own my own home now. Thank you, Harold. So, um, but yeah, we we were completely wrong about OU last year, and. Thank you to Harold for uh, telling us how wrong we were because I, I said they were a seven to eight win team and they won six games and they went to triple overtime with with Kansas to win yeah. their sixth game. So um, it, it, it took a miracle, Harold. took a miracle a for them to win six games last year. He's Butch now. Butch, yeah. So hope you're listening. Uh, I, I will admit that I was wrong about OU last year. Um, yeah, they were much, much worse than I thought they would be. So, uh, again, Harold, I apologize. And, um, Venables was not run out of town because he was not good as a defense coordinator. He was, he was scapegoated by Mike Stoops. Um, and the entire OU fan base didn't want to tar and feather him in the streets after that happened, even though that was factually correct as well. So, uh, going back to this, uh, Texas team. Houston's not going to be good. I, I don't know what to think about BYU. Um, a bunch of Mormons. They're all 30 years old, and th- they could be frisky. So don't want to put a whole lot on, on BYU there. Oh, Kansas State. The frisky 30-year-olds. Yeah, Kansas State's going to be going to be the wild card in this conference this year. And then I I, I, I don't want to go down the road again, but I don't think is going to be very good. But <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> what, what the fuck do I know about that? Um, and then you have Iowa State and Texas Tech ten this season. And like I said, I mean, I, I think their I think their season rides on on two games at Alabama week two, and then Texas Tech at home in the last game of the season. I think if they get by those two games, they're going to be looking pretty for a college football playoff spot. Yeah, main thing for from an NFL draft perspective to watch for here is Xavier Worthy. Guy had guy balled out as a freshman. Looked outstanding. Wasn't so good last year, but he was playing through a broken hand, which is kind of important as a wide receiver to have you know full capabilities with. So he's back to full health this year. Depends Watch on for how he to. performs. What was that? <laughs> so it depends on who you ask. <laughs> But, yeah, that – I mean, Jatavian Sanders is a hell of a tight end, too, that they got there. Tavondre Sweat on the on the D-line. But the, the guy I'm really interested in outside of viewers is Xavier Worthy, a wide receiver. Yeah. Um, if viewers isn't good, what I'm most interested to see here is how quickly and when would they make the switch to Manning to Arch? So let's say let's say they lose to Alabama close. But then if the Baylor game's close and they win, do they make the switch going into Kansas? Do they make the switch going into Oklahoma? Do they wait for the bye week? If if they're winning games, let's say they lose to Alabama close, but it takes everything they got to beat Baylor, it takes everything they got to beat Kansas. Say they win both of those games by a, a late score, one possession game in the fourth quarter to Kansas and Baylor. Do they make the switch at Oklahoma, or do they ride it through the bye? Because they can afford a loss to Alabama, but how? Yeah. How long do? How long of a leash does Quinn Ewers have in this offense? Is kind of what I'm saying. If he's fine, I think his leash is pretty long. If he's fine and injured that's where i think the question becomes they're like oh just we're just gonna sit him get him back to 100 percent, and then he never gets the job back type of thing potential but this is this is the best chance they have at reaching a playoff for a long time yeah they're going to that they're going to the sec west after this season to where they're not gonna be playing kansas state texas tech oklahoma mm-hmm. state anymore they're gonna be playing mississippi state Ole Miss, 
LSU, Georgia, or not Georgia, Bama, Auburn. Um, so, I mean, this, this is the year. So, do they let him keep winning close games against teams that they should beat by double digits? Sark was where, Georgia, before this? Bama. Bama. Okay. But he was there at, it was after the uh, Jalen Hurts Tua thing, right? He, no, he was he was in the forefront of that. Maybe the leash is shorter than I expect. Yeah, he was he was the OC during during the whole Jalen Hurts Tua thing back and forth. Then they pulled Tua for Jalen Hurts, and then put Tua back in, and then uh, all that. Yeah. Yeah, he was, maybe yeah, they. He was right in the thick of that. Maybe it's shorter than I think. Then, yeah. But I mean, after after the Oklahoma game, Houston's not going to be very good. BYU's not supposed to be very good. Then Kansas State's their first real test after Bama, and then, like I said, I don't think TCU's going to be very good. And Iowa State is dog shit. So, and then it's Texas Tech at the end of the season. So, we'll see. But Iowa State. The, Lost their starting quarterback to gambling stuff. It's a shame. <laughs> Probably for the better. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is the team with the most high hopes in the Big Twelve. So uh, we'll see what you can do, Horns. On to K State, Kansas State, the team that just consistently always is in the mix and comes up short at the end of the season. Kansas State, year in and year out, positions themselves to be a playoff team. They're a, they're a top six, seven team in the nation with five weeks to go and always finds a way to fumble it at the end of the season. And then you look at their schedule this year and you're like, oh, Oklahoma State's early. Uh, Texas Tech's pretty early. Like, oh, you get through that early season? Oh, you get through Texas? This is a team that, I mean, this is the Wisconsin of the Big 12 to where they can just fuck everything up because they can go on and beat Texas. They can beat Texas Tech. They can beat TCU. And then in their last three games, lose at home to Baylor, go to Kansas and lose. And then I wouldn't be surprised if they lay an egg with Iowa State coming home at the end of the season. I mean, Chris Kleiman, he, he's done about as good of a job as you can do replacing uh, Bill Snyder, yeah. who was a legend there for decades and decades and decades. But this team always finds a way to just shoot themselves in the foot at the end of the season. And they should be a very good team. They have a lot of talent on this team. It's going to be a very competitive conference this year. And... The epitome of this team would be undefeated going into the Baylor game and losing at home to Baylor and then going to Kansas the very next week and losing again and just sinking the entire conference. That is the epitome of Kansas State. All I have to say is that whoever's replacing Deuce Vaughn has some big shoes to fill. Big little shoes to fill. (laughs) And if they stop by the Cowboys facility, they might be able to get them. Yeah, some toddler shoes to fill. But no, I mean, this is going to be a good team. And yeah. just like Texas, I mean, I they kind of control their own destiny. Uh, they, they don't play Oklahoma, which I don't know if that's better for Oklahoma or them. And then pretty favorable schedule. I mean, they go to Texas, but Texas isn't a hard place to play at all. I mean, they got some of the weakest, like, tea sipping fans in the world i mean if you have to go if you have to go to a top five team in the nation and play an away game there i think texas would be at the top of anybody's list as a top five team you'd want to play at their place um they do go to texas tech they do go to texas tech that that's rough crowd just added twenty thousand seats joe mcguire is real yeah 
There's a lot of battery, a lot of shit. <laughs> Anything you can think of is getting, getting thrown your way, brother. Uh, not proud to say it, but I mean, it's just one of those things. Um, <laughs> West Texas <laughs> hospitality. Friendliest, friendliest uh, city in the nation. But yeah, I mean, the road games aren't tough. Uh, outside of the tech game, I mean, at Missouri, Missouri's not going to be good. Oklahoma State, I don't think it's going to be good. Texas, they're good, but if you have to go on the like, would you rather play Texas on the road or Baylor on the road? I would, I would rather play Texas on the road and Baylor at home. And Baylor's not even that that fierce of a home crowd. Um, and then Kansas, I mean, God loves them. I mean, they play at a high school stadium like TCU does, so it, it doesn't matter. So. That stadium is hilarious to see on broadcast. Not gonna lie, I don't. I don't know how. I don't know how they're still a Big Twelve team. Honestly, like I know Big Twelve doesn't have like SEC requirements, but it's like, hey man, Obviously. at least let, like let me get my whole family in here. Let's talk Kansas for a minute because they are returning more more production, more players than almost any team in a Power Five. And Lance 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 and that was a six-win team last year who was feisty all year, lost their quarterback, and remained feisty. 71-year-old Lance Leipold. Everybody talked about him leaving jobs, and my biggest argument was that he waited his whole life for a big opportunity. Nobody gave it to him. Kansas was finally the one that gave it to him. And you think a guy that waited 50 years for his opportunity – is going to leave after a little bit of success. No, this dude's a Kansas lifer. He could be the one to make Kansas a legitimate top 30 program in college football. Lance Leipold could be here for the next 10 to 15 years just putting out better than average talent and making runs and being... Being the top 30 program that Kansas has been dying to be. I don't think anybody in Lawrence, Kansas is dying for a national championship in football. I think they're just dying for relevance. And Lance Leipold is going to give this team relevance until the day he retires. Absolutely, man. I Like when I was throwing all this together, I couldn't believe some of the rankings I was seeing. Like PFF 73, 24-7 at 74, FPI at 68. And the eight people, this team ended up at 36. Like, yeah. they're returning everything that they had last year, pretty much. They probably have one of the worst schedules as far as Big 12 teams go. I think they play all the best teams. So, UCF, I think, is a very underrated Big 12 team this year. I think UCF's going to be very good. They also play Texas. They also play BYU. They play Oklahoma State, who doesn't have a whole lot of hype, but – one of the probably the best coach teams in the conference while also playing Oklahoma, Texas Tech, Texas, and Kansas State. I mean, as far as a Big 12 draw of opponents, they they got the worst draw out of anybody. Yeah. Oklahoma State's they, they got Cliff's boy now. So watch yeah. out. Last time he was in the Big 12. I mean what was his name? Uh, let's see here. Where are you at? There it is. Alan Bowman. Alan Bowman is back in the big. Oh 12. yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Took a detour but, um, up to Michigan and came back to the big 12 and he's ready to just sling it. He's took ready him, to sling it. Took him like three years to recover from the punctured lungs, but now he's back in full. <laughs> he's ready to. Ah oh, man, I wish he was slinging to protect. I still don't know dude, how much I trust You could keep him off the field when he was at Tech, man. That dude played through like just crippling injuries. Like I'm not coming <laughs> off the field. He, he like yeah. left the hospital at halftime to come back. Like <laughs> he's, he's a maniac, and I, I don't know how much I trust Tyler Shoke at this point. But uh, he's about all we got. But going back to Kansas and their schedule, I want to like Kansas this year, but I mean. They have the toughest schedule in the Big 12, and it's not even close. And, just, I mean, their out-of-conference isn't that bad, but, like, Arizona State – or, no, uh, Nevada is not an easy team. Illinois is not an easy team. I'm talking about out-of-conference games. Missouri State they should they should be just fine with. But 
I mean, they play the toughest of the tough when it comes to the Big 12 Conference. I mean, in my opinion, they play they they play the top five teams in the Big 12. And they might also be a top five team in the Big 12, but uh, the only two breaks they have in their entire schedule in the Big 12 schedule is Iowa State and Cincinnati. Every other team is a top flight team in the Big 12. Like, that's rough. All I know is I've never time, rooted for a Big 12 team that's not named Texas Tech as hard as I rooted for Kansas last year, and it was fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was very, very fun. But, yeah, I mean – I think Lance Leipold's got this thing going in the right direction. I, I, I think I think they're going to stay relevant this year, but I don't have a whole lot of hope for them as far as I don't think they're going to compete for the conference. I, I, think, I think if they make a decent bowl, if they win seven to eight games, I think that is a roaring success for Kansas football. And when we, when we see the, the newly structured Big 12, with Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, and who's the fourth team? Arizona State, Arizona, Utah, and why is it? Is it Washington? Is it? No. There's four coming Washington. from the Pac-12. Yeah, I don't remember who the four who the fourth is. Anyway, whenever we see that new nearly structured Big Twelve next year. Uh, with the with the four new teams coming in, Colorado. Um, yeah, uh, I expect them to be right there, middle of the pack, if not upper middle of the pack team. And I think if you're a Kansas fan, that is an astounding success from the past twenty years. Okay. Uh, you want to move on to Notre Dame, or you want to anyone else in the Big Twelve you want to touch on first? You kidding me? We're doing a whole episode on Texas Tech next week, so I figured that we're saving that for next week. Oh, we're doing a whole episode on Texas Tech next week? Oh yeah, okay. we talked about that. No, we didn't. But we'll move on to Notre Dame. Yeah, next week's episode is just one to two hours of Texas Tech football for you. Oh. Oh man, I'm so excited for that. I was I was excited to get into it now and I saw saw we we're already an hour thirty. I was about to get nervous. Uh <laughs> Notre Dame. Our boy Chris still, Watt. Ter- Chris Watt still doing his oh, thing no. up there? He's with the Colts now. Colts. Moving on There's up in the Colts. World. Good for him. Up there with Jonathan Taylor trying to get a trade out of there, probably. Um <laughs> But <laughs> Notre Dame, the the most overhyped team in the media and the most over-hated team on social media, if that makes sense. Social media hates yeah. Notre Dame, yeah. while mainstream media loves Notre Dame. And I think they fall somewhere in between. Yeah. Yeah. it's about right. Like, I, they don't deserve the hate that they get, and they don't deserve the love that they get. I think they're a fine team, and they should they should be a playoff contender at the end of the season. Yeah. I mean, I... You have Ohio State. You have USC. tough. You have Pittsburgh. You have Clemson. Like, this, is this the toughest Notre Dame schedule that Notre Dame's had in... But, it might at be. I didn't. Game. I didn't look at it before now. But like, this is tough. So I mean, they play Navy in Ireland week one, uh, or Why? week zero this weekend. Why? Because they're fighting Irish. <sighs> that's, that's. I don't know why you're game. putting twenty-year-old kids through like that type of travel and that type of jet lag and, and like and you expect them to be good after that like i know they play they play tennessee state the next week but still that stuff can keep messing with you for a month after oh yeah i mean i mean last last year you had a uh, you had nebraska play fucking uh northwestern in in europe and that's a conference game and they made them play in Europe and both teams were 
terrible all year. Like, what hey, are but we doing here? Casey Thompson was a Heisman winner after that first half. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I mean, so, NC State, like, I don't, I don't think they're going to be good, but they're not, okay. they're not terrible. Ohio State, Duke, Louisville, USC, Pittsburgh, Clemson, Wake Forest, Stanford. I mean, when you're looking at this schedule and you say Stanford might be one of the easier games on the schedule. Oof, imagine saying that five years ago. <laughs> yeah. That, talk about a program that's fallen far away. Yeah, they might lose their football program. Yep. That's crazy. But, um, yeah, I mean, this, I mean, if they go undefeated, they're, they're the number one team in the nation going to the national championship or going into the college football playoff. I think, I think they jump, I think they jump Georgia and they're the number one team in the nation going into college football playoff there if they go undefeated because they, yeah. they have the toughest schedule in the nation, in my opinion. Like nobody else plays in Ohio State. A Pittsburgh, a Clemson, a Wake Forest, and a uh, USC. You're talking about the best of two different conferences right here. Three different conferences, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, win your games and you, you earn you, – you win your games and you earn the respect. I, I mean, that's all that I'd say about Notre Dame. I mean, they, they should be good, but – Go go out there and prove it. Go out there and win your hey, game. It's, I'm really interested to see how Sam Hartman does in a real, like, real life offense. Yeah, same. Because he played he played really well, but like that was not the offense that we're gonna see him. You know, like that was yeah. a very collegey offense, and Notre Dame is gonna run pro style all the way. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I like Notre Dame this year, but I think their schedule is way too damn tough. I mean, I think best case scenario for Notre Dame is we see them in a New Year's Six ball. Yeah, I can believe it. I mean, it it's tough. That It's just a brutal slate that they have there. And I, I think with every other conference, I mean, they could possibly lose two games and be in the thick of it. But without having a, a conference championship, I, I I think one loss completely puts them out because I think a I think a two loss conference champion and the ACC, Big Twelve, and Pac twelve all get in over them. Yeah, it's tough. They gotta win. Gotta win. Yeah. Win your games. Win your games, and you're in. That's, Easy as I that. Mean, you're independent, so easiest thing happens. in the world. Just win your games. Win your games and you're in. Uh, that's that's what sucks about being independent. But you've been offered plenty of bids, and I haven't taken it. All right, now we're moving on to the University of Southern Ooh. Carolina, California. Excuse me, University of Southern California. Caleb Williamses, Cliff Kingsbury, and Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley, Caleb Williams gonna be wild i don't know if you've ever had a better offensive combination of coaches talent with player talent in the history of the sport but their defense also couldn't tackle anybody last year (laughs) literally couldn't tackle so you don't see teams like this rank top five in transfers often this is two years in a row the dudes are just coming flocking to caleb they're like we want in on this caleb williams is patrick mahomes with hype because patrick mahomes had no hype in college he was just a dude at Texas. i mean everybody in the big 12 knew about it everybody at tech obviously knew about it but like nobody really knew about it Caleb Williams is a Heisman winner. He's probably the first Heisman winner in 40 years that has legitimate hype to repeat and not really have a whole lot of competition behind him. Yeah. Like, he is... 
Caleb Williams right now might be a top 10 NFL quarterback. He is he is that good. He's a monster. And I mean, he's just watching him play football is just ridiculously fun. It's incredible. And if you've never watched Caleb Williams play, like mark your calendar. Go watch USC games this year. It's fun. Yeah. So looking at their schedule, um, San Jose State, Nevada, Stanford, Arizona State. Arizona State might be tough. Colorado, Arizona might be tough. Notre Dame, that's their first real test. But after that, their schedule gets brutal. Mm-hmm. Go, They have at Notre Dame and then at home to Utah, who they lost to twice last year. Cal's a pretty easy game. But then Washington at home. Washington might be the best team in the conference. Oregon might be the best team in the conference. And UCLA might be the best team in the conference. We don't know who the best team in the conference is. But you play all of them at the end of the season. Like, you play the cream of the crop at the end of the season. So, I mean, yeah. it's... It's nut up or shut up time at the end of the season. And I, I'm not worried about this offense whatsoever. But like I said, last year, their defense couldn't tackle. Yeah. I mean, they they loaded up in the transfer portal. And a lot of new faces on defense. A lot of turnover on that defense. And not because not guys left. Like, they lost, what, Makai Blackman and Tuli Tupelotu. I mean, that that's... That's really all they lost in their defense. The NFL is two guys, but they there's a lot of new faces, which means that they brought in guys to replace starters. Yeah. So, I mean, this I, I think this is the best offense in football. And if their defense can be a top 40 defense in college football, it's it's them and or it's them in Georgia. In my opinion. I mean, if their defense can be top 40, I think they should be favorites to win it all. I think so, too. I I think their defense last year was like... I think think their defense last year was like 112. And they barely missed out the college football playoff. I can believe it. I think the highest ranking defense in the Pac-12 last year was like 76. And it was like fucking Stanford. I mean, this team averaged 40 points in 500 yards a game. <laughs> and they yeah. didn't make the college football playoff. <laughs> like, they lost to Utah, and they lost to Utah twice. Yeah. That's ludicrous. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm cheering for USC. I mean, you know, I'm cheering for my tech boys, Cliff Kingsbury, uh, Lincoln Riley, both tech boys. And if you forgot, they are both tech boys. So... Let the people know. Gotta let them um, know. Gotta let them know. But yeah, excited to see what they do. And Caleb Williams, I mean, he he's Patrick Mahomes with the hype. All right, we are on to Michael Penix Jr. and the Washington Huskies. Michael Penix Jr. I shit on that kid so much at Indiana, and he's just turned into a great quarterback only took six years of college football (laughs) only took five years years. this but hey i I mean he processes the game great like he you want he 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 is devoted to the craft and he is athletic on top of it with a big arm i i think that's the best team in the pac-12 it might be they're returning a lot of talent I think I think I think this is the team that wins the Pac-12. I think they go to the college football playoff. I think I think I'm leaning USC over them. Yeah. We uh, we had three more teams in this conference at least to talk about, but. We, we already have our picks for this conference, but we can still move on. Let's see. Who else to... we got? I was trying to think. Oregon Oregon or USC. Those are the two that I, I'm i in on. Well, Oregon. Well, we can go to Oregon next. And that was talking Huskies. 
<laughs> I love you, Huskies. I mean, I don't have a lot to say. You're a really good football team. Yeah. Uh, okay, going to Oregon. Um, I think you're going to lose a lot of confidence when you go down to Lubbock week two. That's true. That this, is the t- tough part, but. This says it's a home game. I'm pretty sure they go to Lubbock. Almost positive. They you go could to be right. I, I manually typed in every schedule okay. for 130 teams. There might be no. in the ass. <laughs> uh, I'm just. I wanted to make sure. Um, let me let me just double check here, just to just to play it safe. Um, I think you're right, though. I'm almost positive, but. Well, it's not even pulling up for me. <laughs> but with Oregon, you got Bo Nix at quarterback. I mean, Bo Nix, the legend. Yeah, I mean, the legend of Bo Nix, the, the legend of Auburn Bo Nix, because he was a different dude when he got to Oregon. Um, a lot better of a quarterback. Yeah, everything just started to click for him. I don't know if it was the RPO heavy offense there or what, but like, you just figured it out seemingly. Uh, this is a diverse, diverse run game, running a lot of option stuff, a lot of RPOs. Um, and yeah, the tight game is definitely in Lubbock, by the way. Okay, cool. I was just making sure. Yeah, yeah. You just threw me off. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to. Oh, no, you're good. But yeah, I mean, they have a good amount of talent returning. It's going to be an extremely fun offense to watch because they're so diverse. The and defense started. should like, be they, really they good, attack too. attack you so many different ways. And, yeah, this defense lot, has plenty you of You got talent. a lot of defensive. Uh, I think they got two guys from Mississippi State coming in. They got a guy from Alabama. I think they got a guy from Georgia. And I think they got a guy from Florida State coming in. Yeah. They, Number nine they probably have, for class. I think, I think they probably have the best uh, talent on defense transferring in out of anybody in the country yeah i mean and i can see like i I said number nine transfer class like if that's more defense than offense you're probably right i told you a couple weeks ago that if if you're listening still an hour 41 into this podcast lock of the century uh lock a little millennium uh game of the year bet of my lifetime is going to be the under in that Texas Tech Oregon game because everybody's going to see it and hammer the over it's Texas Tech and Oregon Texas Tech and Oregon what do you when you close your eyes and you say Texas Tech and Oregon are playing what do you see 65 75 80 points game's going under it's going under 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 take the under week two I don't even know what the number is going to be I don't know I, Unless the under's like 30, we're, we're taking the under, boys. That's right. I'm down. Taking the under. I got burned on some but, tech unders last year, but I'm down to get burned again. God, <laughs> every time we got burned on an under the very next week, it'd be like 10 7, too. I know. Um, <laughs> we we're directionally correct. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the Pac 12's tough this year. I mean, so. Not only do they play Texas Tech, but um, they have Colorado at home, which I'm not too big on Colorado. They only they didn't win a single game last year, I don't think. If they did, they only won one. But Shadur Sanders, Deion one. Sanders, um, they're gonna they're gonna be re-energized, to say the very least. And uh, feisty, but you I don't, don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to play an energized team that early in the season, especially after potentially coming off a loss week two. Um, and then I wouldn't worry too much about the Stanford game, but then you have at Washington, Washington state coming to you, then going to Utah after that, then Cal USC, Arizona state, Oregon state, Oregon states. If, if DJ Ongalele is any good at all, Oregon state is the sleeper of the century in this conference. So, I mean, they just have a very, 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 very tough schedule. Uh, looking at conference play here with the out of conference game being Texas Tech, who unbiasedly I think is going to be a very good team this year. I just want to give a shout out to my dude in last year's draft, Malasela Alamve Laulu, out of Oregon, sixth round pick. 
was pounding the table for this guy last year in the, in the draft. Looks like he's week one starter at offensive guard for the Baltimore Ravens. So shout out to you, man. Making you look good. Oh, yeah. That's what they're there for, to make you look good. I've been saying it for years. <laughs> All right. So next up here, who we got? We got Oregon State. DJ. Oregon State. You. Oongalele. Oongalele. A lot closer to home. He's a West Coast kid who's playing all the way yeah. out, out there in the SEC. Wonder if that's going to make an impact or not. I don't know, but uh, they probably have the best running back in the nation. Yeah. Damian Martinez is an absolute freak. And if they can keep running the ball like they did last season with Jonathan Smith as a head coach, this team is nasty. And if DJ Ungalala can be a beast i mean this team won 10 games last year yeah yes i didn't even shock the world that's shocking to me right now i forgot like i typed this in oh, i didn't remember they won 10 games I, I i never told you about them last year i was telling everybody that would listen last year to bet on oregon state i don't remember it did i miss that ah oh, man Maybe I was too scared to say it on the podcast because I didn't I, I didn't really believe it myself, but I was doing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, Oregon State won me a lot of money last year. They, um, Damian, yeah, Damian Martinez is, is an absolute stud, and they have another running back too. I can't remember his name, who is really good, and they're returning a ton. I mean, it, I mean, almost their whole offense is coming back. Yeah. And as far as Pac-12 schedules go, I mean, they play Utah, they play UCLA, they play Washington, they play Oregon, but they avoid USC, and they play Utah early, and they play Washington, Oregon, back-to-back to end the season. But outside of that, schedule breaks pretty well for them as, as far as it all sits. I mean, San Jose State, UC Davis, uh, San Diego State to Washington State. And then Utah is their first real test. And then um, Cal, UCLA. Then they get a bye week at a very opportune moment going to Arizona and Colorado in back-to-back weeks. Then that's a perfect bye week for them. Then Stanford, Washington, Oregon. I mean, this team is – everything breaks their way, I feel like. And for for a, a new quarterback coming in, your first real test, week five, got some, got some time to develop some rapport for them and everything. I mean, I love the potential of this team in back-to-back years. I don't know. I don't really know what to – like, can you say they're a sleeper team when they won 12, uh, 10 games last year? They're, st- they're, they're, they're still a sleeper. No one knows about them. So, like, they're still a sleeper. Yeah. But, no, I, I, I love the potential of Oregon State again. I mean, like you said, re- returning most of their potential or most of their production, like – all right. Well, with that being said, let's let's close it out with the, the Southeastern Conference, starting with right. Georgia. I'll let, I'll let you take this off for a second. Yeah, so Georgia, I mean, 10 players drafted last year, but top five recruiting class every year, so not really too worried about that. They have a new quarterback, new man under center, Carson Beck, who actually, I mean, I... It might be an upgrade at quarterback, but I don't know. Stetson Bennett's weird. Like, I have a hard time valuing what he was doing there. Um, I think the offense might be more open with a more talented quarterback. The, the playbook might be a bit more diverse because, honestly, what, watching Georgia's offense last year was kind of like watching paint dry sometimes. It was just like we're bigger, stronger, more athletic than you, and we just don't need to do that much. Um, so... I think this offense could get a lot more fun if they open the playbook more. It could just be, like, intense. But really, the one thing that stands out to me with them as, like, my question mark is there's only one Jalen Carter on Earth, and he's gone. I mean, I, I, you can bring in all the one, or the, the, the top one, two recruiting classes you want. You're not going to come across a lot of Jalen Carters. 
So that is the one thing that's kind of irreplaceable that they lost because everything else with the talent they're bringing in, the coaching they have there, it, they'll mm-hmm. replace it just fine. But I you just don't see D tackles like Jalen Carter very often. Yeah. Um, I would say that that might be an issue, but I mean, kind of said the same thing about Jordan Davis and I mean, Jordan Davis isn't Jalen Carter by any means, but I mean, this is, I mean, this is probably the most untouched have been talking about Jalen Carter as the best D lineman on that team since he was a freshman, you know, like, I mean, it it was, he's just different. Yeah. I mean, he's just different. Uh, and a lot of people passed on him for the draft. So, uh, maybe he's not different as much as we thought he was, but if he avoided some, I mean, of the, uh, s- some of the police charges, he, I'm pretty sure it would have gone real early. I just, I just don't like the Eagles. Um, <laughs> um, Fair, but it's. I mean, this is this is the the upper echelon of the upper echelon. I mean, I think it's Georgia and everybody else this college football season. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's still. <laughs> They're still the favorites, and they should still be the favorites. If they were, if they win it all this year, they'll be the first repeat since pre World War II. Yeah, I mean, if you if you give me Georgia versus the field, I'm probably taking Georgia, honestly. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't blame me on that. I mean, I'm probably agreeing with you. So I mean, and also when you look at their schedule, I mean, they might have one of the easiest schedules in all of college football, not just for the SEC, but. UT Martin, Ball State, South Carolina, UAB, Auburn, Kentucky, Vanderbilt, Florida, Missouri, Ole Miss, Tennessee, Georgia Tech. There's a chance that they don't play a ranked opponent all year if Tennessee is not good. Yeah. Because Auburn's not going to be ranked. Auburn's going to be dog shit. Vanderbilt is a bottom 100 team in the NF or in the NCAA. Kentucky's dog hey, shit. Hey, hey, hey. Florida's Vanderbilt not good. won five games last year, sir. Uh, <laughs> started a lot of other teams. Um, Moving on up. Florida's, Florida's not good. Missouri's not good. Ole Miss might be ranked. Okay, so I'll give them Ole Miss and Tennessee. But are, it, are either one of those teams going to be ranked higher than 15? They're going to go to the SEC Championship with their – with potentially their biggest win being against a number 21 Ole Miss or a number 17 Tennessee. Yeah. Like, I don't, don't know if we've anyone. seen... Nothing else I don't know if we, Georgia. I don't know if we've seen an easier schedule all night. And yeah. it's the best team in the country. Yeah. Yeah, no, they'll be there. So, I mean, they're a shoe-in for the SEC championship, right? Yeah. Have to. And probably the playoff. Yeah. I mean, I think I think they could lose the SEC championship and still get in if they win all their games by 20, 30 points like they should. Yeah. All right. So, that being Alabama. said, other side of the coin, Saban squad. All right. With his three-headed Everybody. monster that no one knows who, what he's going to do with. Everybody's always said, you'll be stupid to bet against Saban. You'll be stupid to bet against Alabama. Last year, all their losses came in very, very close situations, and they're right there in it. And everybody said, like, oh, they, they, they probably could have beat Georgia at the end, but uh, LSU played Georgia for the SEC Championship. That's a lot of people don't realize last year when they talked about um, the old uh, Southern accent boy coming out, coming down there from uh, Notre Dame, uh, Brian Kelly uh, having a failure his first year at LSU. Uh, he he won the SEC West and played Georgia in his in the SEC championship game. I don't really call that a failure, even though I don't really like LSU going into this season. But that's what happened. And Alabama, all their losses were really close. Um, yeah, two losses I don't, I don't, by a total of five points combined. I don't think it's the same Alabama team. I I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. Maybe I'm just excited for a new era of Kirby Smart football. Kool-Aid, huh? 
maybe I'm just excited for a, a, a different era and maybe we're just in the Kirby Smart era now. Or maybe I'm just hoping we're in the Kirby Smart era now. But something about these Nick Saban teams the past couple of years just just aren't screaming Alabama to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they go out there this year and they do Alabama things and they just clean up. But that, that week two game versus Texas scared the shit out of me if I'm an Alabama fan. And then you have all Miss coming to town a w- two weeks later. Mississippi State, Will Rogers, uh, new coach, playing for Leach. Yeehaw, like getting on that wagon for Mike Leach. I mean, you never know what that Mississippi State's going to be. Texas A&M, number one recruiting class last year, lost everybody. Don't matter. Still had that number one recruiting class last year. Um, going to going to Kyle Field that week five. Arkansas, Tennessee. Tennessee, a team that beat you, old Rocky Top, old Rocky Top, uh, week five last year. Um, and then you still have LSU coming in, Kentucky and Auburn. Not only do you have a super, super tough schedule, but I mean, you've proven that you can't you can't win those big time games, those those close games here in uh, in in recent history. Uh, the Joe Burrow year, Joe Burrow came in and wiped the floor with you. I mean, every time there's a good team coming in, uh, Hendon Hooker did his thing to you last year, um, and then that LSU loss last year. I mean, LSU had no business beating you and beat you last year. I mean. You're not the Alabama of old. It's the Kirby Smart era, and you probably have the toughest schedule in college football this year. I I think you're on to something. I mean, I look at these Alabama teams, especially last year, because I've watched so much Alabama tape of, like, mainly defensive and offensive linemen. Um, And, man, it, it just got me thinking, like, Alabama's not producing the hogs like they used to. No, you know, I mean, like Will Anderson, he's an edge rusher. He's he's more finesse, more like more fundamentally sound, but he's not just the big mauler that they used to produce. Like, where's the Quinnen Williams, the Jonathan Allen, the Deron Payne? Like, those guys are not. I I I haven't seen them in a few years now. I'm starting to wonder are they still doing it because that's what made them so good. Even like the Evan Neal's, yeah. I mean the the well their their offensive linemen have never really panned out in the NFL at least not the tackles uh, it's weird uh, their, their tackles have always struggled in the NFL. Yeah, um, I mean their 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 interior linemen seem to do well though. Yeah, their interior seem to do real well, but <laughs> for some reason their tackles just do not. Maybe it's because their interior is so good it covers every covers up a lot yeah. of tackles. But I don't know, but look, I, in look, the pits look. they're not winning like they used to, and I mean you can see it in their. And their stats here, their e- e- EPA per run allowed is a little above average, but it's not like this ain't a team that's shutting down the run in their sleep yeah. like it used to. Be. And you look at some of the great linebackers and like interior safeties that they've had too. I mean, the uh, yeah. I, I I can't think of any linebackers off the top of my head, but they, there's been plenty. Oh, uh, they had some big thumper like Rashawn Evans and like uh, yeah. Um, the guy that went to Washington um, fell in they the draft. Even had the, yeah, uh, even but even in the defensive backfield, like the Xavier McKinney's, the uh, Minka Fitzpatrick's that that filled that void as well. Uh, yeah, the Teron Diggs, the Teron Diggs that was playing nickel for them. I mean, the they're still before. producing safeties well, I think, but like the cornerback town. I mean. I, I gotta watch some Kool Aid McKinstry. I can't. I can't say that he's not all that because I haven't watched him yet. I but, feel like I've um, been hearing about Kool Aid McKinstry for like the past like three years. Like, and if it wasn't for his name, you would never hear about him, other than yeah. the fact that maybe he's at Alabama. But yeah, I mean, I can't speak to whether he's he's up on that level or not. I do think Alabama really started focusing a lot more on wide receiver and secondary players, and that's why we've seen the trenches kind of kind of fall off. So. Yeah. No, but I I mean, is there a harder schedule in the in all of college football than what they have here? Notre Dame's up there with them, but it's Yeah. I don't know. I mean I, I'm not even too high on LSU, but I mean it's a tough game. Uh Auburn Auburn 
Alabama might be the biggest rivalry in college football going to Kyle Feld at Texas A&M, who I don't think is going to be very good either, but it's a hard place to play at Mississippi State. I mean, Mississippi State has just quietly been one of the best, like, mediocre teams in the SEC for the past 20 years. I mean, I think I think they have, like, 17 straight years of making a bowl game. Like, they're never great, but they're always just very solid. Um, Ole Miss with uh, the lane train there. Um, and then Texas, who, who should very well be a top five team all year. Tennessee with a quarterback who probably has the most arm talent we've seen since Jamarcus Russell yeah. uh, there with Josh Heupel. Um, and then Kentucky's not like not. I don't, I don't think any of these teams that they play are extremely talented, but they don't, they don't get the, the breaks of like bad teams. Like they usually get outside of middle Tennessee, South Florida, like out of conference games. Yeah. But all their conference games and Texas are all very solid teams. And they might not be great, but they're definitely not going to be like rollovers either. Yeah. I mean, that's. And this is a team that's only returning 40% of its production from last year, too. On top yeah. of. I mean, you lost a, a very savvy quarterback. And you. I mean, here we are sitting here. It's almost week zero. And we don't know who's starting for Alabama. Like, yeah, this hasn't happened since Tua was there, you know, of like who is the quarterback. But the last time that happened, it was uh, New England's quarterback that just came in and just. Yeah, I mean, Mac Jones just <sighs> stepped in seamlessly. Everyone knew it. Knew yeah. he was good already because it was like we saw him. But for he the last was five games the year but before. Mac Jones wasn't even the quarterback until like week one. Oh, was he not? Same situation. Yeah, I know. I mean, a lot of people, it was like assumed, but he was an older guy. He'd been there for a while, and everybody was like, is it really going to be Mac Jones? Well, because he, he it, played it so well when Tua got hurt the year before. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, a lot of unknowns at that quarterback position, but, hey, I mean, I, I think they'll be good, but I, I don't see them competing with Georgia. And I wouldn't be surprised if they don't find themselves in the SEC championship for the second year in a row. Honestly, this ranking, like AP number four in the AP poll, number three in the coaches poll, you're just trusting the recruiting rankings more than anything because 40% well, of this team's production is gone. Yeah, and Nick Saban. But, like, we haven't seen a lot of these guys play college football, you know, or not, yeah. a, not a ton of snaps. Like, we don't know what they are yet. So it's hard to – Hard to say what I expect or don't expect outside of variance, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, for me, Alabama, I think I think they're a 9-win team, 10-win team. Uh, if I'm if I'm having to bet totals, I'm probably going under. And I think they're a, a New Year's 6 team. I mean, I think they're going to be very, very, very good. Upper echelon, uh, missed college football playoff, probably missed the SEC championship. Um, they are what they are at this point and maybe Saban turns it back around but I'd be willing to bet Saban retires before he finds himself back on the top of the mountain yeah I I wonder if he's lost his fastball a little I really do and Saban losing his fastball is a is a top five team in the nation yeah yeah <laughs> don't, I mean don't it means he's not winning the natty every year <laughs> yeah, like let's not let's not get it twisted. We're not shitting yeah. on Saban here. It means instead of being the best team every year, he only has a top six team, and it just so happens that the other teams in this conference are keeping him out of national championship contention. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. You want to talk LSU before we wrap, or? Yeah, we can talk LSU, the most overrated team in the nation, probably. <laughs> so Ooh. AP Paul. Five, Brian Kelly. I mean, like I just said, I feel like Brian Kelly was severely underrated in his first year. Like nobody talks about the fact that they went out and won the SEC West. They competed for an SEC title. But if you look at the team overall, I mean, there was a lot 
to be desired on the field. Jaden Daniels is sitting at the top of Heisman watches right now. Uh, I think he's the third highest favorite in Heisman watches or uh, Heisman odds right now. I- I'm just not seeing it with this team. And they that Florida State game week one is going to tell us a lot about this team. But... I, I'm just not seeing it. They they do have a pretty favorable schedule. Really, their their schedule comes down to uh, Florida State week one, and then they have Alabama and Texas A&M to end the season. And the rest, are they should be pretty, pretty well favored in uh, the rest of the season. So, you win the games on your schedule, you're going to be all right. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a rematch in the SEC championship, but – Talents there. The 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 team that we saw last year, I mean, they were begging to lose some games that they won last year. Just begging for the other team to win that they ended up winning. Like if they're if they're gonna take a step, I think you need to see Jaden Daniels become more than a game manager. Like you need to see him what, like I mean, something. A lot like of people think him. he's gonna be. They do. I mean, like and I, I said, he's I haven't seen it yet, and like I, I, I need to see him become more explosive. One, one of the favorites for Heisman. I mean, he's he's up there. I mean, the expectations are there for that for him to do something. So, um, to me, this is this is Georgia's conference to lose. I think the West is going to be frisky. Uh, I, I don't think A and M has a legitimate chance, but. You almost have to think Jimbo's going to put something together eventually. Maybe he's not. Maybe Texas A&M is just Texas A&M, and they're going to be a mediocre team for eternity, which would be hilarious to me. But at some point, Jimbo has to do something there, right? You would think. I mean, if he's going to do it, Weigman seems like the guy, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, he came I mean, in Connor his Wegg- first start last year through four touchdowns, like just nothing. Yeah, I mean Connor Wegman is has been been declared, and they got the number one recruiting class declare. last year. <laughs> they got the number one recruiting class last year. I don't, I don't, I don't think they have anybody yeah. left from that recruiting class, but um, uh, no, they, yeah. they 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 have most of it still. Oh, so all the transfers were from other classes? Yeah. Uh, they they, they like retained people almost that entire number one recruiting class. Oh, good for reckon. them. Good and for those them. guys should yeah. be actually playing this year. So, yeah, I mean, so Jimbo, you got your fake national championship ring to be determined, and you've shit the bed every year you've been at Texas A&M. Um, Texas A&M, as much as they act like they're an elite program, I mean, they were middle of the pack to lower of the pack of the Big 12 for 20 years before they went to the SEC. The only high point that Texas A&M has had in 40 years is Johnny Manziel. Outside of that, you're a mediocre to lower lower tier program. But everybody anoints them. Everybody is on their dick and they hire Jimbo. They give him the fake ring to be determined national championship ring. And I don't like Texas A&M. I, I despise Texas A&M, but at some point you have to do something. You, you have the talent, you have the recruits, you went out and you got your, you got your national championship winning head coach. At some point, you have to do something. And the West is completely wide open. Like, why not this year? Like, you have New Mexico. You have Miami. You have UL Monroe. Auburn, Arkansas, Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Abilene Christian, LSU. It's a winnable Shout schedule. Out ACU. Shout out to ACU. Oh, God. I hope ACU beats the fucking brakes <laughs> off. That would be so funny. But, um... You have Alabama, Tennessee, LSU. You have a you have a three game season this year. Just go out there and do it. Just just do it one time. 
So Dude. I'm not hilariously right every year about how much of a dog shit program you are. You have you have some of the most money in the entire nation coming into your program. And you can't do anything. And it's just sad. It makes the entire state of Texas look bad. I, I could I could give the same rant to the University of Texas. It makes the whole state look bad when you're getting hundreds of millions of dollars pumped into your program and you're dog shit. Like, please, for the state of sex, Texas state sake, just just be decent. Like, I'm not asking you imagine, to overperform. We're just asking you to meet expectations based yeah. on your efforts. Imagine if that money was getting pumped into into Baylor, or TCU, or SMU, or Texas Tech. Like the the schools that are doing more with less. Imagine if that money was going towards there. We might actually have a national contender in the state of Texas. But no, it's all going to A and M in Texas, who historically do less less hey, with hey. more. TCU was a national contender one time, and they play in a high school stadium. You could fit five <laughs> TCU stadiums in Kyle Field. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Pretty sure that pretty sure that's factually correct. <laughs> almost think, almost positive that's factually yeah, correct. I think you're right. Like I, I I'm pretty sure the the TCU stadium you could fit two of them in just Kyle Field's upper deck. Yeah. Like <laughs> It's it's ridiculous, like all the all these people pumping in money. Like, hey, uh, let, let's throw a couple million to Houston. Let's throw a couple million to TCU, uh, Tech. Uh, uh, I mean, let, let's just try to get a national championship out of Texas because University of Texas and A and M ain't fucking doing it. I'm just saying. All right, I think that wraps the SEC. Time for to us. diversify. Yeah. <laughs> so good luck, A and M. I. For for the sake of Texas, I I hope you're not dog shit again for the thirteenth year in a row. Vanderbilt won five games. Never forget. Never forget. God, they're gonna. Oh, Vanderbilt's gonna win the <laughs> SEC. <laughs> All right. And I think that is all we've got. All right. Next week we're gonna talk Texas Tech. And oh, we'll yeah. talk oh, college we football are talking finalists. Texas Tech. We'll talk college football finalists uh, um, or college football playoff contenders next week. So we'll choose, let's say, s- seven, six, eight, ten. We'll choose some schools. Yeah. We'll, we'll choose. Many. We'll choose however many schools we want to choose and talk about them for the college football playoff. We have t- talked about all of them tonight, but we will we will simplify that into a smaller group. Talk college football playoff. We'll talk Texas Tech. We'll talk week zero reactions, and we'll have week one picks. We'll have picks next week. Is that already next week? Hot damn. Yeah, we, we can have picks this week if you want. We got week zero in two days. Let's go. Uh, well, you got a week zero pick for me? Yeah, throw it out there. All right. Uh, I'm taking I'm taking Notre Dame cover 20 and a half versus Navy in Ireland. Fighting Irish. First game, 1.30, 1.30 kickoff central time, 12.30 kickoff your time. Notre Dame's going to cover 20 and a half. I'll also take... Vanderbilt to cover 17 and a half versus Hawaii because Vanderbilt Hawaii is games. dog shit and Hawaii is terrible. All right. Give me the UTEP money line. Minus 114. Hell yeah. And then also, also, te- get, also, these are all official, officially on the record. I'll take over 66 and a half in San Jose State, USC. Because Caleb Williams is going to put up 70. I'm jumping on that with you. 66 and a half. I think San Jose State puts up at least 14. <laughs> we just we just need 55 out of USC, boy. Let's get it. All right. 
Oh man, it felt good to rattle off some picks there. <laughs> All right. Well, Texas Tech next week. Rackham, we don't have a week zero game, so we can't be spoiled by next week's episode. So <laughs> there we go, boy. There we go. All right. All right. We'll see y'all next week, and I hope y'all listen to all two hours and 15 minutes of that glorious college football talk. Adios.